Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Digital Writers Festival 2014. Um, today, we're doing a panel called The UFO in the Garden, or Internet Writing. Um, so I'll give you some context on the name first. Um, in an article appearing in the New York Times in September last year, Talin recounted the steady and private way the internet became part of his life. Like me and many people on this panel, Tao is old enough to remember a time without the internet, but young enough to have experienced solitary exploration of it as a teenager. Now he sometimes imagines the internet as a UFO that landed in his garden, which his parents first noticed but then became half-hearted about, while their son, as if by instinct, relocated his life to so I'm here to speak to a mix of writers, publishers, editors, journalists and artists who have themselves relocated their lives to the UFO in the garden or have witnessed it happen in some way to others. So um, I'm joined by Crystal South, a writer and artist working from Portland, Mira Gonzalez, a poet, columnist, Twitterer currently living in Los Angeles, um, Blake Butler, who's a novelist and editor of HTM. HTML giant, Adrian Chen, who is a freelance journalist and former Gawker writer who is in Manila in the Philippines, and Michael J. Seidlinger, who's a novelist, designer, and publisher, editor at Civil Coping Mechanisms. Um, uh, you'll be able to ask questions if you want using Twitter via the hashtag DWF14 hashtag, and um, the way, because there's so many of us, the way I'm going to do this is to direct questions towards specific panel members. So when I'm directing a question, say, towards <coughs> Crystal, you should direct your questions via Twitter towards Crystal. And my first question is going to be directed towards Crystal. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my first question is for you. You wrote an essay called Identify Yourself, which talks about um, your work on the internet as both an artist and a writer, and also just as a person. And because the internet is not a physical thing like a radio, a television, or a book, and because it broadcasts itself off pre-existing technologies, it's difficult, I think, for particularly older people to conceptualize it as a medium. Um, would you say that, as an artist, the internet is your medium, or are you using other older mediums and just using the internet to distribute? Well, it was definitely difficult for me to explain my project to my parents. Um, they they understood that I was writing an essay, and they understood the book form of it. Um, but they, I think maybe they didn't understand the part where uh, within the essay there's a lot of hyperlinks um, that point you to the actual places where like I saw things that sort of changed my experience online. So it's definitely easier to explain that project as, as an essay that took the form of a book and a website to people. But as far as like my work in general, I would say it's still, I still think of it as writing with language and creating images and making videos. Um, but I think that that content is directly um, intended for the internet, which is hard to sort of quantify because I've been doing that since since I was like a little kid basically so I remember writing and drawing things and making images that weren't um, that weren't made to be shared necessarily but like as long as since I was 12 basically I've been putting things out into the world into a system that like creates a community around it and allows for feedback from other people, which I think is the unique difference between uh, former mediums and the internet. Um, so it's a complicated question. I mean, the medium is the message, and my message happens to be sort of directly related to the internet and and directed towards the internet. So it's sort of this like endless feedback loop of of being influenced by the internet and putting and putting those things back in. Does that mm. answer that? Yeah, definitely. And so I have a question from at Joshua Words. Um, have you worked on any collaborative projects online? Was it a fulfilling experience or will working IRL always be more enjoyable? 
Well, I mean, that seems sort of specific to the project, but I've done a lot of things entirely online. I mean, I've made works of art with people, um, many of which whom I've never met. I did a project with an artist named Chris Wood, uh, who runs Computers Club, that was um, essentially myself and three other female artists kind of making videos of ourselves um, crying <laughs> and, and having an online discussion with someone. And, and that was a completely, like, internet-mediated artwork from, from the, like, idea of from meeting those people to ta having this conversation with them about this idea and then creating the work itself all happened digitally. Hmm. And it was awesome. And, and you mention in your essay that you formed some of your closest friendships via the internet. I guess Joshua's questions also could apply to that. Is there a difference between online friends and IRL friends? Or could you fall in love online and never meet the person IRL? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, some of, the, some of the people... I have friends that I met online when I was like 12 years old on Usenet news groups about teen poetry that I've still never met that I keep in contact with that like now, now work at Facebook. Um, and I have fallen in love online, I, I think. And I think, you know, like I, I preclude some of my statements about people by saying it's like an internet friend, but that's only for the benefit of other people. It, it, I don't make that distinction in my mind, I guess. Hmm. Interesting. And now, Mira, I'm going to move on to you, direct the question to you. Mm -hmm. So your, your writing, as far as I can tell, is often about things that happen in your life, IRL. Um, and um, your book, I'll, ne I'll Never Be Beautiful Enough to Make Us Beautiful Together, has been hugely popular on the internet, and it's highly personal. Here it is. Do you ever feel... That's fine. <laughs> Do you ever feel like it's um, your personality or your, like, yeah, your personality that's gone viral in a way, and how does that make you feel? Um, like, like, do you think, like, like, do you mean am I marketing my personality as opposed to, well, like, not, writing? Not necessarily marketing it, but you, it happens to be what you write about, and your writing happens to be very popular on the internet. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I feel like a lot of times I'm writing about very personal things, so I'm marketing a very personal aspect of myself or my life, so I put in uh, parts of my personality into writing or into Twitter, so yeah, I guess I don't make the distinction between, like, my personal life and my art, if that's what I'm going to call it. Um, it's basically the same thing to me. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, definitely. But then, how does it feel if, say, you know, you you're, you can write a poem that's hot if you don't separate these two things, but then a poem of yours is reblogged ten thousand times, and um, these highly personal things are kind of being dispersed across the globe. I mean, I think that, that's that what I. It is weird. I mean, I think that's what I mean to do, though. I think like I don't have a very good sense of personal boundaries or a very good sense of what I should or should not share with people. Um, so I think, like, I get it. My, my editor is in town saying my house is doing something super distracting on the other side of this panel right now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it does feel weird in that, like, I'm writing about something very personal and then thousands and thousands of people on the internet are seeing it and deciding they like it enough to reblog it. It feels life-affirming to me, I guess, for the most part. Um, but, yeah, it does feel weird sometimes. Like, it feels weird that anybody would be interested enough in my life to do that or to read that or be interested in that, I guess. But it's worked out, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to remind if anyone watching, you can ask questions by the hashtag DWF14. Um, now, Blake, I've, I have a question for you. Um, so, for a number of years now, HTML Giant has been a place where people talk about internet writing in the comment sections, which means 
it's also inevitably been a place where trolls have trolled. Um, and you can't really control what people say in the comments section, unlike the editor of, say, a newspaper. Um, yet the comments are still associated with you as an editor. Uh, how do you deal with this when there is a comment thread that um, you feel terrible about but is just continuing anyway? I don't feel terrible. And the, the approach of the site from the beginning was that it was chaotic. Like, I'm not, editor is a really loose term there because I really just like asked people whose personal blog I like. Like, I guess at that time there was like 50 people with blog spot addresses, which everyone kind of abandoned now, and it's like a wasteland, but I just was like, we should have all these people right in the same spot so I don't have to go to 20 websites every day. Um, so I guess I don't, it's not, I'm not really an editor, I'm more like I like to make a mess on the internet because it's, it's a shithole to me, and the bigger, the deeper the shithole can ride, like the more fun it is. And so, yeah. But even then, like it, it's kind of like a personal challenge in, in self. Uh, uh, like I like that my skin continues to thicken. You know what I mean? And um, like I don't really take it as a bad thing when people are angry about what happens in comment forums. I think it's like hazing of some sort without physical violence because that's what they, the internet's like a focus point of ambient psychological violence and like this is focused around art instead of whatever 4chan is talking about video games so I don't know it's it's not meant to be controlled by me it's just meant to be a focus point I guess so but I do think it has an effect like uh, emotionally like People have emotional reactions to it, so I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's a phenomenon more than like a magazine or something. I agree. But <laughs> sometimes um, this type of troll activity can translate into things that happen in the real world, and I guess, Adrian Chen, you'd know a lot about that, um, considering sometimes your writing has led to um, things affecting you in the real world, such as um, I read somewhere that you had to wear a tutu with a shoe on your head as a result of an article you wrote for Gorka. So um, can you explain the experience of how your internet writing has translated into things that have affected you in the real world? Uh, yeah, I mean, the first time that happened was probably in 2010 when I wrote a lot about 4chan and uh, that indirectly led to Gawker getting hacked and all of our users, you know, personal information being leaked and a huge headache for uh, the place that I worked. Um, and, and actually out of that, you know, I get a call, I got a call maybe like five months after I wrote all these articles from this like Chinese lady in Queens and she's like, oh, I got uh, a bunch of like postal, you can send prepaid postal boxes to somebody for free, and that's like a prank that 4chan does. And she says, "I got a bunch of these boxes for you. They must have, you know, found her address somehow and thought it was me." Um, and and that's kind of the first and only real life thing that has ever happened to me. But it wasn't really to me. They just screwed up and tried to tried to prank me. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I I I feel like I always just try to you know, when dealing with people online, just try to deal with them like people, you know, and, and interact with them and kind of play along with, with what they're doing and, and not just kind of take it as this, like, uh, I guess Blake says, you know, this ambient psychological violence. Like, there are always people there that you can kind of reason with and, and deal with. Um, and sometimes that means, you know, uh, the reason why I put a, a shoe on my head and, and a tutu was that these people in Anonymous said that if I did that, they'd give me this big scoop about, you know, all of these um, email addresses that were leaked, and it actually ended up just being a prank, so I just looked kind of <laughs> dumb. Hicks. <laughs> we have, we have this, is all B, this is all B, board, whatever, random, right? For, yeah, 4chan, Anonymous, I mean you know, random people. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, 
I actually know Crystal from this message board that we were on in Portland a long time ago, and so I think, you know, ever since I was in college, it's it's just been, um, you know, there's not a lot of boundary between what I'm doing online and and what I'm doing off. Yeah, and it was our pers like friends that we knew in real life, and then slowly expanded out to be like this circle of people that we didn't know, and that's that's when I left. <laughs> yeah. So Adrian, we have a question from you from uh, rat underscore tits. Um, <laughs> right. well, whatever's on screen in front of you is more interesting and more important than whatever's happening around you. True or false? Why? <laughs> false. Uh, I, I mean, I I think that that's a pretty ridiculous thing to say, especially since, I don't know if you read this, um, there's an article, this this woman, Liza Dye, who's a comedian in New York, she just fell into a, in, into the train while she was texting, um, and it's been kind of a big story uh, in New York among people I know, but that, that to me is the ultimate, you know, cautionary tale that you can't just ignore what's going on. She's okay, though, uh, apparently, so we <laughs> That's can... That's good. <laughs> That's right. Um, Michael, I have a question for you. So you run a small press called Civil Coping Mechanisms by yourself. You design, edit, publish, and distribute. Um, do you have training in these areas, or are you self-taught? And could you, would Civil cop Coping Mechanisms be possible without the internet? First of all, you don't have to call it the you know Civil Coping Mechanisms. It's just CCM. That's fine. That works. Um, self-taught. And no, the answer is no. Without the internet, there would have been no way to actually launch CCM uh, <laughs> as it is now. Social media has been pretty much the lifeblood of the press. Um, we have had zero actual advertising, like money. So, like, we haven't. I've never used an advertisement, like an actual ad, for like some website or whatever. And I have never actually gone to any kind of true publicist or anything like that. Everything we've ever done and everything we'll ever do is online via uh, social media. So the answer is CCM would not exist um, without social media. So given, given that um, and given how often you seem to like things on Facebook, how much time do you actually <laughs> spend on the internet every day? Um, probably, I see I multitask, so I'm like I'm writing, I'd write maybe like a paragraph but also have Facebook and Twitter in the background. So I'm online pretty much. Whenever I'm writing or doing anything, I'm online as well. I'm never not online. So 10 hours a day, probably. That's it. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Blake, I think we have a question for you from Twitter. Um, it's from Suzanne. So it says, so you create your own personal dump space. Is there an agenda in exposing the violence and deal found in digital landscape? Exposing the, is there an agenda in exposing the violence? I mean, it's not really a personal dump space. I think there are good things on the internet. I get value out <laughs> of certain things, but it's like you have to, to like dig through the shit to get to it, and that's kind of makes it better. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, I, I think sometimes about whether I would have kept writing if I, like I, I was writing before I got on the internet, and I almost think about like, I can't write without the internet, but it's not because the internet's good, it's because I, it's the same as like, writing by hand, I feel like I've lost a limb, you know what I mean? Like, I write differently when I write by hand rather than typing, and I feel the same as when I'm typing and I don't have an internet connection, like there's some kind of like, it makes you think about it more. To ha not have it there, and I think that also parallels to the way that like there are good people in these forums, like full of like idiots spouting off the first thing that comes into their head. But watching the continuum of people trying to one up each other makes the good things stronger. I don't know. It's like I don't know. I don't. I don't know what I'm saying by that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that you, you you can't expose violence by yourself, but you can stand in the middle of it and not be a piece of shit. Um, 
Uh, but everyone else, but someone, the 80 80 percent of everyone else is going to do that. So I don't know. It, it's just like it's unavoidable at this point, and and to continue to be a person in the midst of all of it. Like when the person asked about what's more interesting than your, the screen or real life, like the, it's becoming a point where there's no difference. Like the woman fell into the subway texting because she was fucking not paying attention to life. Like those two things are going to come together, you know, and like it's get, it's becoming a point where there's no there's no crossover anymore. So you have to learn to survive in it and you have to learn how to do like when I think about actually writing like it has nothing to do with the internet or social media or bullshit like that like you have to learn to continue to do your own thing in the midst of what's around you. Hey Oscar, um, can I ask uh, Blake a question really quick? Sure. Can I ask, yeah. Hey Blake, so like when you write, do you actually do you write maybe a couple lines and then go back to Twitter or <laughs> Facebook? Do you kind of alternate between the two? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always open. So, like, yeah. I think that, but that that's nice. It's not, and that doesn't mean that, like, I think people use social media in art too literally sometimes where it's like, you IM'd me, I'm sucking my own dick, and so that's in my book now. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah. I, but you can use that in the same way where it's like, you just IM'd me, I'm sucking my own dick, and that made me feel this, now I have this emotion from that. And right, right. now I'm going to say something in the continuum of the thing I was writing that has nothing, no one will ever know that that person said that to me, but it changed my mood, you know, it's, and like mood is so important for writing. It's funny that you say that because uh, I, I heard a, a talk by William Gibson where he was talking about um, Bruce Sterling can only write with a TV on and he like made like a contraption so that a TV, he had a TV right above his like computer and we just like write that all day, and I feel like it's kind of a similar thing. Like it's like the ambient, you know, kind of inspiration and and just feeding off of what's going on. Right. It's what I mean. That I couldn't write with a TV in front of me to save my life. My brain would immediately be like fucked and off. But that like just for some reason the internet's natural. But like yeah, I think you get in that routine and like you can you can gather things. Like you see the color green past the screen in a commercial and all of a sudden your mood has changed, you know, it's good for you. Yeah, man. Gibson, I, I a good use, like, Twitter, man. I use Twitter. I can, like, I can just scroll through different photos and stuff like that. And sometimes just seeing a photo or a series of photos will kind of merge you into a, some other thought that can send you into a different scene in a book or something like that. Exactly. Do you think that's about control, though, because you don't have control over what you're consuming on TV and you do have control over, like, what and when you're consuming things online? That's yeah, I think that has something to do with it, man. It definitely does. Yeah. Um, Mira, I'm gonna ask you a question that's kind of related to the lady with the screen and the train, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, if you're, do you spend a lot of time on the internet every day? Oh yeah, a whole lot of time. Too much time. So, so if your writing is about things that happen in your life, and you're spending a lot of time on the internet. Um, can you write about spending time on the internet, or is it kind of impossible to do that? Um, I think it's a lot like what Blake said. I feel like more and more the distinction between being online and being in real life is is very blurred. Like, I recently, the last year, was living in New York with, I'm going to say, like, pretty much every single person I knew in New York, aside for, from one person, were people who I met on the internet. So I think that everything that I do online nowadays at least can lead to things in real life or at least be merged with things in real life. I mean, like when I say I'm on the internet, it's not always necessarily like I am, bless you, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> like I'm in my room alone staring at a computer screen. Like there's, you know, other aspects of the internet that can lead to real life relationships or, you know, things like that. I mean, I'm not, you know, as much as I can have antisocial tendencies, I'm not alone staring at my computer 100% of the time. I think that the internet can lead to a lot of real life events and a lot of real life friends and relationships and those tend to be the things that I have written about in, you know, my book or, you know, online or wherever. Um, like I think you can, like if I'm tweeting about something, I could be out with friends or doing whatever it is that I do and then I'm still on the internet connected via my phone. It's kind of hard to get away from it. I think that the lines are definitely blurred for sure. Mm. Do, you, 
do you read a lot on the internet? And like, if so, where do you go to read good things? Yeah, I read a lot on the internet. I mean, I read um, a lot in general. I read books also, but I would say that a, a lot, if not most, of my reading occurs on the internet. Um, and, like, do you are you asking like what venues I read from or like what websites? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I read a lot of things on Twitter every single day and things that, you know, my friends write. Um, I read HTML Giant. I read a lot of things on, like, Thought Catalog and Vice and other places like that. But for the most part, I read things that I see people have posted other places, generally speaking. Most of the time when I read something, it's because it's by a specific author who I'm interested in, I would say. Okay. Um... I have a question for you, Adrian. Um, do you think it's possible, given this kind of, that the lines between IRL and internet have blurred, as people are saying, is it possible to be anonymous on the internet anymore? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it is. Uh, you can't do, if you really want to be anonymous, you can't do a lot. I mean, I think that any time anybody who's anonymous becomes well known there's a very good chance that they're going to they're going to become unmasked and i think the idea that you can have like you know infamy and anonymity at the same time is kind of not not le legitimate and not really realistic and you know a lot of people will say well why can't this person be anonymous but you know i i always find it hard to to be like, oh, you can have it both ways. You can be, like, super famous as, like, this anonymous person, but as soon as somebody tries to kind of connect you to your real identity, then it's like, oh, no, I need my privacy, you know? Yeah. Um, and Crystal, a question. If you're distributing your work online, um, so much of the feedback is direct and it makes you feel great when people respond to your work, um, but do you... Do you feel dependent on the validation of likes and reblogs? Is that what determines the value of your art and your writing? Oh, no. No. I think, I mean, art has always been like a pretty personal thing for me, and especially that project that I, the ID Yourself project that I did for uh, TBA, like that kind of came out of the conversation that I had with the curator of that festival, and for me it was almost this like trying to archive my what I remember now about the early internet and growing up online because I feel like I'm forgetting so much of it so and I mean all of the writing that I've done in my life is is sort of towards that purpose of sort of personal documentation which might sound like I don't know shitty but I I'm just I'm really terrified of forgetting the things in this in the way because things are changing so so fast that it just seems impossible that I'll be able to like keep keep my memories sort of separate because they seem to be compounding so quickly. Um, but it's I mean it's nice it's nice to get feedback from people and a lot of times people point out things that maybe I I had in a passing thought but then sort of moved past and um, people's comments always sort of point out things to me that are amazing and exciting and plus like I can't even I can't even read that thing now like it's my my writing process is like very weird where I like don't go back and read things for a number of years because it's like really difficult for me for some reason Do you have um, a sense of nostalgia at all for like the internet when you were 15? Is for it like everything. a lot? I, I mean I have a sense of nostalgia for everything like literally like things I'm nostalgic about yesterday um, so it's hard for me to like s separate that, but I do I do feel a really intense sense of nostalgia about early internet in that it felt like um, it felt like a parentless like you're at someone's house and their parents aren't home and you can just kind of do whatever. Um, I, I don't get that feeling anymore necessarily unless you try and function as like an anonymous alt or something, but. Um, there was definitely a different sort of feeling and like that you know you were onto something that maybe people weren't <laughs> weren't part of <laughs> that other people didn't know about like I, I was totally the kid that was like you guys the internet and nobody fucking even knew what I was talking about it looks so good Adrian thanks <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you guys gotta get into the all that stuff. Uh, get into the sidebar. <laughs> Click on uh, um, I hope that answers the question, but, like, as far as nostalgia, like, I'm, I'm the wrong fucking person to ask, because I am nostalgic about everything. Michael, do you, what are your earliest memories of the internet, and do you feel nostalgic for them? I can't remember a week ago on the internet. Honestly, I'm the exact opposite. I'm not nostalgic at all. I kind of, like, my memory over time has gotten so embedded with what I do on a daily basis that I can remember what I'm currently working on, what I need to be doing, and also the future. When it comes to the past, there's kind of this, dis this, dis this disconnect in sort of like a way. Like I start, lo whoa, look at that, Adrian. <laughs> but anyway, um, to answer your question, yeah, no. Um, a week or two ago, yeah, I, I have trouble remembering. Um, there's yeah. a cake right there, Mira. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what, what, is this, is this, what is this? Is this Google FX? This is Google FX, right? Yeah. Get in there. Uh, Adrian, there's, sorry. there was a general question from um, Susan. Um, how much is your identity shaped by the internet? Is your current um, Google FX your new identity? <laughs> Adrian? What? <laughs> I'm just fooling around with the effects right now. That's, that's Adrian's new press photo. This is How my much is your photo, identity yeah. shaped by the internet? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, how is it shaped by the internet? I don't think it is really shaped by the internet. I think it's a, it's a you know, constant interaction uh, and... Uh, Maybe, maybe you know the the most I can say is that it certain certain features and things reward certain parts of you more. You know, I think that if if you get deep into being on Twitter or you know being a public person on the internet, it does shape you know the kind of like fast thinking wittiness or whatever that's in you know popular on Twitter. If you're on on Instagram, maybe you're gonna become more you know. Uh, voyeuristic or or something like that, but yeah, that's about all I can say. Okay. Um. Well, maybe I'll let you guys ask each other some questions if you have any. Mira, do you have any questions for anyone? Um. God, I don't know. Um. Or any of you? Well, there was a couple of questions that came through. Uh, one of the questions was, how much time daily do you spend online? Mm. Which, which is hard. I'm online officially from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to sleep. Well, know? does it count if you're like on an iPhone, or do they mean like I, literally? I count, I count that. Oh, then I'm on the yeah. computer. I'm like online. Probably like unless I'm asleep, I'm online all the time. <laughs> yeah, I count I count iPhones and mobile devices, so yeah. Jesus, that's day. super depressing. Yeah, I'm online 100 percent of the time. Yeah. <laughs> until I'm until you right right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I'm uploading pics of us to Facebook right now. Oh. Great. Yeah, I was just emailing. <laughs> Does it count double if you're on your if you're on your phone, your iPad, and your computer at the same time, or triple? Yeah, is that like three times the internet? So you're like double, actually 60 hours. A day. <laughs> Man, right here, yeah. That's a lot of yeah. internet. You can't be more online. <laughs> you can be I'm online. I'm super online. online. Like, what if you're like, hanging out with people you met from the internet? Does that count? What? Sorry? Does that count like, like, you get, like extra points if you're hanging out with people you met on the internet and also on the internet at the same time? Yes. <laughs> So I'm on the internet yeah, like that's that's my art. We don't need any. We don't need any other explanation. Just yes. Just yes. <laughs> so one other question that someone asked was, does anyone on the panel have thoughts on the idea of post digital? What is, is post digital? Digital. Like when people, I I take it as when people reject the internet and want to like have their own CSA or something. I've never met anyone like that. Yeah. Really? I don't know. <laughs> CSA? You, what's that mean again? Uh, like people, people that reject, like everyone that's getting off of Facebook or they don't want to have a cell phone. 
Uh, yeah. They're, I think they're just kind of like fed up with the constant stream. Some people just don't know how to deal with the constant stream. So I, I kind of like equate that as, as such. Yeah, they just... Uh, I think people like that avoid me. Like, I don't <laughs> think anyone like that wants to hang out with me. <laughs> they can do whatever they want, right? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> they're free. Is, they're has free. Anyone, has anyone on the panel met anyone that's post-digital in real life? <laughs> no. <laughs> It's like the lock they're, well. they're invisible, I think. If you're digital, you can't see anybody who's post digital. <laughs> Interesting. Um, have, you, like, have you ever dated someone that didn't have a cell phone? That sucks. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> so another question has come in. Um, I'm going to address it to Blake it's from Sam Twyford Moore. Do we measure literary success in retweets or followers rather than book sales these days? Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't think that has anything to do with the internet, really. Like, retweets are for, like, I don't know. I never thought about books. Yeah, I don't think I've ever looked at my... Whoa. What the fuck? Who did that this? Was that was the we need more Mexican music. Um, I was about to get moralistic. I'm not going to get moralistic. Of course, literary retweets matter more than anything. <laughs> so that's the answer. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer, I think. I have a question for Adrian. Um, yes. So you, you write things that appear in print sometimes, correct? So do you feel like you take on a different voice when you're writing something that you know is going to be only on the web versus in print? Um, I mean, it's, it's different because, you know, when I'm writing, when I was writing for Gawker, uh, there was not really any editing, and so I kind of had to self-edit, you know, I would be writing really long things and really, you know, in-depth things, and so I would always have to kind of be my own editor, and I feel like now that I'm writing for print, um, where it's more heavily edited, it actually is kind of the same, I mean, because I'm used to always kind of trying to trying to go ahead and be like, what would, you know, somebody who's not me say about this, you know, because, like, when you're writing on the internet, I think people are like, oh, I, I mean, I, it seems like there are two different, two different uh, impulses. One is that, oh, I can just write whatever, so I'm going to write all this crazy shit that would never, you know, happen. But I think the other impulse is that, well, I am going to be the only one to look at this before it goes up, so I have to be my own editor, my own copy editor, and I have to kind of have a distance from what I'm writing um, that I wouldn't if if I'm just know that you know it's going to go through eight rounds of editing. So um, I don't even remember what the question is, but yeah, that's that's I I found that that it wasn't as intense of a jump as I thought, I guess. Um, Michael, I have a question for you. Yep. Um, given how much. Do you, do you make your own um, selections for who you publish with CCM? Yes. So uh, do you receive a lot of emails about, with submissions? Yeah. Um, average these days is about like 30 or 40 a day. So um, I just, average. Yeah, I get <laughs> sometimes seems like middle of the week is the big time, like when like people just swarm me on the CCM uh, Gmail. But um, yeah. What was the question? And how many uh, of the books you end up publishing come from submissions versus um, people that you solicit? And if you do choose people amongst you know the thousands of blogs that you read, how do you choose which is going to be you know worthwhile? Okay, so that's like a two-part question. Okay, the first question is how many are via unsolicited and how many are via solicited? I'd say about 60-40. So 60% solicited, 40 unsolicited. And then the second question was what? Was, um, the, second, 
How do you with blogs and stuff? Uh, oh yeah, with blogs and so forth. I just I keep an eye out and ear out. You know, I just I read a lot. I uh, make sure to always check out the latest e e book or or um, those those journals that come out and like on Scribed or whatever it's called. All everything. I just try to keep a, a good overall overview just to see what's going on. And uh, yeah. Does the good writing jump out at you immediately, or is it something that can grow on you? Um, more most of the time it jumps out, but there have been cases where um, stuff has grown over time. And someone who I initially had seen the name of on like Twitter or Facebook, I never really made it much of a made much of a. I didn't really think much of it at first, and then later on I realized, well, okay, okay, this person surprised me. I mean, this is some really interesting um, stuff. Yeah. So. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Twitter. I'm going to uh, direct it to Crystal. It comes Ooh. from Bianca. Um, given how much time you spend online, do you think social media interferes negatively with creative work sometimes? Um. Yeah, probably. I mean, I. I. Hmm. Yes. I think, like, I have a tendency to sort of shut it off if I'm really trying to, like, get something done. So, like, I definitely will take a time, like, block off an hour where I'll try to just, like, shut off my phone. Um, but I also think it's, I mean, it's how I find out about, like, other writing that's going on or it's a great way to, like, just look at what people are talking about? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can't really imagine my life without it, so it's hard, it's hard to say if it's positive or negative. Um, mm -hmm. um, and we have another question, um, and anyone who wants can take this. True or false? Short attention span is the new avant-garde. False. False. <laughs> False. Blake says false, but I say true, man. I say true. But actually, okay. Well, let's hear from the affirmative from Blake first, and then we'll go to the negative. I'm the negative. Blake's the negative. Everyone else seemed like the affirmative, but I have no oh. facts to back up what I said, so don't ask me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with Mira. I, I, never, I, didn't, I didn't think the question through before I said whatever the fuck I said. So I, don't I just know. liked it because I have a super short attention span, so if I could like call it something better than having a short attention span, that would be really sweet. <laughs> yeah. Like, why do you think it isn't the new avant-garde? <laughs> Six out of seven people said yes, so it can't be the avant part. <laughs> uh, it just can't. But I also don't believe in tailoring output to what people's abilities are. Like, yes, more people. I would say the status quo's status. The status quo's attention span is very short. That doesn't mean you have to go make shit for the short attention span because it'll just keep getting shittier and shittier, and then we'll like. Um, I don't know, we'll be worshipping, like, dirt in 40 years. I don't know. I just think, like, I think it should be a, a point, I think it should cause it to go the opposite way and maximalism should be important. Like, yeah, you should think about the fact that you have this much time to get someone's attention for 48 hours, you know, like, because there's so many people creating so much stuff and, like, um... But that doesn't mean that you you have to create for your audience. Like I just don't believe that. Yeah. I don't know what avant garde is, but yeah, avant garde. Yeah. I've always like used avant garde as like the reason. Like if you don't have any other explanation for something, it's avant garde. I feel like that's okay. what it is. Well, I have a very. I think there's a very clear explanation for why we have a short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's gonna ge keep getting shorter. And so like I don't know. I just don't. I don't think. I don't believe in Taylor. Like for me, one of the only things I get out of the internet is like I'm kind of a contrarian by nature, and so. Half of my the energy I get from the internet is like I see people saying and doing things and I'm like fuck that like I have to like destroy it. Yeah. You know? So I gain a lot of like negative energy and turn it into positive energy hopefully. But I was gonna ask Adrian about this though, like having written for Gawker and stuff. Like what? Where's the line between like if you're writing for the internet, which I think there's a very clear difference between writing for the internet and writing for say a book or something. How, where, what's the line between like 
Like you have to have some percentage of link bait so that anyone will even click it among the thousands of things. Where's the line between creating link bait and creating something that's actually substantial and worthwhile in that in that arena? Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like any online publication that is commercial is always going to have stuff where they're like, we're going to do it for traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that one thing that you I I think that I liked about Gawker is that they were upfront and were like, all right, we're just gonna like have one guy who's doing this, you know, and we're gonna and and I feel like it was kind of a trick, you know, it was almost like it was almost like a joke, like yeah, we're gonna have one guy who's just like totally the traffic, you know, monster, and I figured that people might see through that and be like, wait a second, why why do you have one guy doing this, like, you know, um, and and how is it that he can so easily figure out just how to how to get all this traffic? Um, but I it kind of worked. Like it seemed like people didn't really care that you know it was kind of like so delineated. Um, and and I think that I think the thing that you have to realize is just like people have their own audiences, you know, and and so like my when you're when you're writing for like a a big site or a site that you know, has to buy the kind of uh, economics of it, has to engage in, like, link baiting and traffic mongering, mm -hmm. you you can just kind of realize that, okay, you know, I have I have my own stuff that I'm putting out there. Some of it's going to be link bait, but, but some of it is going to be good, and you kind of have to cultivate the people who are going to realize that, you know, what you're doing is good and not just... And, and even see through, like, the bullshit that you have to do sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's the key. That's what always has worked for me. Use it, use it to your advantage, but also create something you can stand by to some extent for the Internet. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, I think that, like, people complain about link bait, but a lot of times the, the best stuff is the stuff that's the link bait. So... That's it's, That's it's hard quotable to, right there, man. That's quotable right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say, you know, oh, I don't like link bait. It's like, you don't like the, the link bait that you don't like, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. True. Good point. It's very good Like, point. did you, um, when you, with HTML Giant, you must worry to some extent about what post will be popular um, and which won't, even though it's not a site like Gawker. I think that... The uh, the model uh, the only thing that we had as a thumbnail for HTML Giant was we were writing about it like we were going to write about small press and independent literature where you write one article like that on the internet and that person is going to do everything in their power to share it to everyone they know like it wasn't we were kind of doing it the reverse like we weren't mentioning you know Sharon Stone's tits or I mean whoever's popular's tits. Um, <laughs> We were doing the thing that, like, this person has not gotten any attention, and they're going to take this and show it to their mom and their grandparents and all of their friends on all of the social media they have, and, like, some of them will take off and some of them won't. So it was just like uh, these things aren't being talked about. It's almost like the reverse. It's not being talked about enough, so we'll, we will take that. We will be the place talking about it before the other people did. And... Um, and we also didn't really care about traffic because we weren't trying. We weren't trying to be a money-making thing. Now we now we get money coming in from all of the residual. Like when you Google things, it's the first thing, and we get a lot of traffic from that. But it kind of like we put the content first, and then it just kind of generated from that. Hmm. Um, I've got an interesting Twitter question. I'm going to direct it to Crystal. Uh, oh. it comes from Paper Radio. Uh, does the panel have an opinion on biases of class access, free time, re online writing, also effects of race and economic geography? Well, obviously, like, we are very privileged to be in the position to be spending our waking hours uh, consumed online. Like, we have access to the actual hard goods and then infrastructure to make those things possible, which is... Uh, a privileged position. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of people in the world that would, like, shit on us talking about any of this because it's such a, like, 
it's you know it's a frivolous activity to like but I mean all art comes from from an excess of of uh, resources and time right like it's that like historically like people have been provided time and resources to to create works whether it's visual or writing um, so yeah I I think there is probably a bias of of privilege on things happening online but the idea is that um, we make that accessible to everyone so that everyone has a voice in that but we're obviously a ways off from from that that's a fucking heavy question too yeah <laughs> it is and Mira why how do you feel about it the, the being, idea of being, uh, being uh, a I think that with any kind of art or anybody who's been a successful artist, at least most people, it either comes from a place of struggling a lot to be able to do the kind of art that you want to do, or a place of already being wealthy and in a good position and not having to struggle in your life. So it can either be from excess and then you have excess time to be able to create the art that you want, or you're going to be struggling. And whether whether you're creating that on the internet or whether you're creating that you know, through visual art or any other kind, it's going to be the same the same thing pretty much and if anything I think that the internet gives a voice to people who didn't have a voice in the past and it gives a it gives a venue for people like like me or like you guys to be able to express themselves and have art and show their art to a large audience I think before that before the internet there wasn't a place for people like us to do that um, so as far as economic geography or physical geography or anything like that I think that the internet is a good tool, and I think that any kind of art that anybody wants to make is going to be difficult to do if you don't have money, essentially. So either you're going to be struggling or you have money and you're not going to be struggling. I mean, that's really the only way, <laughs> sadly. Adrian, do you have an opinion on this question? Um, I mean, I think that... I think that the idea of maybe like internet writing is like a, an idea that comes from a certain kind of privilege or like you know I I think that it's it's uh, you know there are a lot of studies and stuff where kind of when you're when you're lower down in the socioeconomic strata that it's hard it's it's not as clear-cut how separate your real life is from the internet. I mean, there's, like, studies where, you know, wealthier people kind of view or are able to separate what happens online more than uh, other people, and I think that, that that is kind of, in the idea of internet writing, you know, maybe fetishizing it a little bit is, is making it kind of more precious than it is when, you know, millions of people are writing all day on the internet every day, you know, uh, because maybe they they are completely shut out, you know, in in ways that are more concrete than you know not being able to get like your uh, poetry book out or something. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like, what do you think? Um, I mean. I've pretty much I made a decision when I was like 16 that I was never going to have an office job. My only goal was to be able to own my time. And then without the internet, I never could have done that. Like I started writing for websites when I was 16, and it pretty much entirely funded a lifestyle where I can do what I want. Which for the last 10 years has been from 10 to 6 p.m. I was writing, you know, not for money. Um, so for me, it's. I don't. I, I'm sure I would be like a, a computer programmer somewhere and never having gotten to do what I've done. Um, maybe better off that way. But you know, I chose that, and I, I like the fluidity of free time. That like, if you, if you have the tenacity, there are, are just there are thousands of sites that are paying money for content, and people. I, I mean, you got to hack it out, but you know, you can make a living online, and that can that can the fluidity of that time can fund you doing whatever you want with your life and I think that's invaluable and that's the greatest gift that the internet has for me anyway um, the social stuff is all secondary but um, if you can if you can get if you can find those sources of income which they're out there like I don't know that's 
uh, it's become more tricky over with time because now everyone it's a, it's a lot. Well, like I guess I started with the internet. Like we got AOL when I was like seventeen. Um, so like I was kind of like already like I want you know like there was less predatory stuff now. Now they'll they'll get someone to do the work that would pay a good wage ten years ago for peanuts, but, you know, so uh, maybe it's not as easy, but there's still ways, I don't know. I, I think it can make, pe it can give people a power that they did not have. Right. Yeah, man, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So does anyone have any more questions for any of the other panelists? Or are we drawing to a close? Okay, well, I think um, with that, I'll give you all a chance to bug any projects that you might be working on at the moment, and then I think we'll wrap it up. So maybe we'll go from left to right, starting with you, Adrian. Do you want to say goodbye? Yep, bye. Uh, not doing much right now. Just check out the new inquiry where I'm an editor. Good stuff. We pay. We always Super pay good. all our writers. Great, thanks a lot. And Blake? Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. Just <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Crystal, in Venice. I'm in Venice, so life's pretty good. I, you know, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing to plug. Uh, really, it's been it's been great. Great, thank you. And Michael? Nothing, man. Just thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mira. Um. Let's see. I'm selling copies of my book that are signed and have original art in them for twenty dollars. If you PayPal Mira L Gonzalez at gmail.com, and I'm also sending it to my room with the book. Does so, that include shipping, Mira? Uh, it does. Great. It's just twenty dollars flat. It's a real deal. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. Um, this has been part of the Digital Writers Festival for 2014, and uh, see you all soon. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you.